Well, thank you very much, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate your organizing this in the way that you have. And it's a special pleasure to be on the same panel with uh, Dean uh, Shui Lan, who I haven't seen in some time. Um, so I do wish to say something about the China West dialogue. You won't be surprised, and um, and and um, address particularly the issues you've raised about the degree to which the Bali G20 summit is a turning point the degree to which it can be a transition to a different uh, level of dialogue and understanding between the US and China. And the thing I think that has to be said is that as others, as Daniel and, and uh, Dean, Professor uh, Zhu have said, is that th there have been several successes from the, the, the Bali G20, not least, has been uh, the Xi Jinping uh, Joe Biden dialogue uh, in a talk in which they renewed their commitment to dialogue. And I think um, that is something that's absolutely vital, not only that they continue to have uh, regular conversations between the two of them, but governments as well have, have a open a new dialogue. And Secretary Blinken's trip is obviously going to open the door on that. How many of the eight um, original groups of dialogues will be open is unclear. I agree with what um, Daniel Russell said that the, the, the dialogue between militaries is clearly a very crucial one. Um, it is also true that I think the Bali summit was a success in a very important way in terms of the G20 summits themselves. I mean, I think what was proven there was that the G20 as a process is a success in not only in global governance and global leadership, but also in, in providing a place and a process in which geopolitical adjustments also take place, like the conversations between um, President Xi Jinping and President Biden. The, the other thing that happened was, as you pointed out, was that there were, and if you look at paragraph, first of all, there was a G20 communique. Uh, they call it a G20 leader's statement. The fact of the matter is that there hadn't been any communiques at all between in the in the Indonesian G20 year, but from ministerial meetings. And the reason for that, of course, was largely the the Russian war um, with Ukraine and the inability to sort of agree on whether to include Russia or not. But the Indonesian President Widodo and their their team managed to to bring the geopolitical issues to bear in the G20 summit in Bali. And not only that, but to actually not only get a, a, a communique and an extensive one on the content, but also on the principles that, um, that govern the international system. It's, it's my observation that you can't have a community if you don't have rules or principles or norms that are universally agreed to and abided by. And I think that paragraph four, as you look at it, to uphold international law and, and the multilateral system, to, to defend all the purposes and principles in the charter of the UN. A mention to adhere to international humanitarian law, which includes a, an explicit mention of protecting civilians and infrastructures, and actually international humanitarian law also protects combatants. And the, as you pointed out, the use of and the and the th threat of nuclear weapons is said to be inadmissible in that in that document. So, this I think was a major point of convergence on foundational principles that can keep. What is it actually at stake? I think is whether or not we can continue to have a single international community, or we 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 somehow diverge in the yellow woods and go to a, a bifurcated world in which there are blocks rather than a single community. And so I think th those, those statements that I've just identified really were a step in the right direction, um, especially in light of the fact that China and the US are, are converged on these, but with important support from Indian Prime Minister Modi. I mean, it was quite visible, quite obvious that he had a huge hand in bringing this about. So the, the thing I would like to say is that I think 
the, this success, we cannot take this as a turning point that depends on the momentum coming out of Bali, but rather have to see it as a fragile, as, as a moment in time um, in which it's up to the governments, of course, and officials, but also those of us in the in the communities of engagement communities that surround the G20 summit, the business community, the scientists, the think tanks, and so on, to support this transition to a, a, a more continuous element, a process of dialogue, both within and around the G20, but also um, independently of it. So I, I think I, th I think we have to have a sense of urgency in the think tank community about the the time urgency of this that if this moment is to be capitalized and realized into a trend we shouldn't just um, leave it to governments to have to make it that happen for themselves but we have to somehow demonstrate that it that dialogue leads to results and i'll have to say um and the that, that with the experience we've had over the last two and a half years with the China West dialogue, where we've had more than a dozen Zoom sessions uh, inv involving 20 people or more, and we've appeared also in three annual Global Solutions Summits in, in, um, in Berlin, um, where the pr fundamental principle of this China West dialogue is that it's a, it's a dialogue that is with China, not about China. So there have never been any of these more than two dozen meetings without China participation. And Jue Lan and, and you yourself have participated in these, as, as have others. And that's been vital. And I think the, the, the other principles, I'll be quite brief here, I'll try to be concise, is that the driving principles of the China West dialogue have been viewing diversity as an asset, because diversity creates creativity. It, there are different perspectives. There's a lot of management literature, business literature in the United States about the fact that you want diversity in your senior management team or you're going to end up with groupthink and not uh, creative ways of, of operating. So the very diversity that's embedded in the G20 is actually an asset. Um, the very diversity that we've included in our uh, group with over 50 people from over a dozen countries participating is an asset. Because pluralism breaks binary conceptual thinking and binary politics, uh, geopolitics. And I think the fundamental, my starting point when I founded the China West Dialogue was the, the fact that leaving the US-China relationship to itself alone was a disaster because binary relationships conceptually tend to create um, dogma dogmatic debates rather than convergence, and that it ends up in uh, feeding conflict rather than convergence. So the other the other principle is complexity: is that complexity is your friend because it creates a policy space. If you disaggregate the issues that the G20 deals with and you deal with them in a sectoral basis, as is what happens in the G20, is you inevitably delve into the complexity of the issues. That creates tremendous uh, opportunity, a tremendous amount of policy space for countries to align themselves differently, not dogmatically on issues. So a, a key element that I think has been true of the way the G20 has operated is that you have shifting coalitions of consensus that countries don't tend to group up on every single issue. They rather shift because of their interests are different in different sectors. So uh, delinking issues is a, is a very important thing as, as Daniel Russell pointed out. So the other thing I think that is absolutely essential to do, which is, is, to realize that the confrontational narratives between the U.S. and China have actually dominated the capacity of global governance and global cooperation to move forward, and that delinking the foreign policy discussions from domestic politics in the narratives on both sides is an important uh, an important thing to do. So, I think that um, that we need to. 
think hard ourselves in the knowledge community and the think tank communities, not only about how we conduct our dialogues, how pluralistic they are, how, how much uh, professionalism can be brought to, the, to bear on complex issues within, uh, within our think tank uh, communities, but also by including officials and including concern about how it is that the dialogues within the think tank community, within the knowledge community, spill over into and serve as an example for and try to, to motivate um, different dynamics in the official circles that are based on the kind of principles that the China West dialogue has proven actually work. So I appreciate the chance to, to, um, to be involved in this conversation. Thanks for inviting me.